get the cool lights on. So, me and Phil, you'd asked about Ansible. Uh, he's my Ansible expert. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so, uh, this is possibly a beginning series on Ansible and some more Linux tutorials, more in depth than I'm capable of at the moment, but where I'm going to learn with you because I want to learn how to do a few of these things better. Uh, I can tell you what Ansible is in concept, but uh, we're going to get into the deep woods of the functional details of how Ansible works. And so basically how to set it up, the real, that which part, that's the easiest part of this. Everything after that's going to show you how to uh, create like a group of them, a uh, yes, we're going a to, fleet. <laughs> we're going to group our servers together. Uh, we'll call it a fleet, and we'll also give names to our servers so we can target them individually and run some commands. Yes. So enough looking at us and the fun lights behind us. Uh, let's just go ahead and get started. So also the recording format, because we're doing two of them, we're doing it in a studio versus on here. So bear with us as uh, we're learning how to record all this at the same time as well. But uh, we're going to do we're gonna jump all completely to the screen from here on out, so you don't have to look at us. <laughs> okay, so Ansible. We are, if you don't know what Ansible is, is a way to use your computer to manage hundreds, thousands, or even three, as we're going to do here in the demo, uh, other systems at the same time that are using Linux. So you can issue a command in group to uh, groups of servers, all the servers uh, in your Ansible inventory. So we're going to cover how to get your Ansible inventory set up. We covered, uh, we'll cover how to install Ansible with pip, which is really arbitrarily easy. Um, and then we'll get dig into some of the command structure and how Ansible works. All right. Um, Ansible for the uninitiated is a way to use configuration management against all of these servers. Now we can run what are called ad hoc commands, just like running uh, commands on my local machine's uh, command line, or we can create what are called roles and playbooks. And we'll get into that a little bit later on because it's a bit more advanced, but it's really the meat of what configuration management is for. Yes. Now, you can install Ansible several ways. You can install it through your system's package manager, such as apt, yum, emerge, what have you. Or you can install it through the Python pip package manager. That Through pip, you can get the absolute latest version of Ansible. Um, since that is super, super easy, and we want to be running the bleeding edge code, we're going to do just that. And we're also going to upgrade any dependencies that Ansible requires. Now, I've already run this command. You will see something slightly different, but the end result will be the same. We will have Ansible in our path on our system. And we'll verify that we have the latest Ansible. And we do. We have Ansible 2.4.2.0. Perfect. Now, like I had said, we are going to run some ad hoc commands. Those are arbitrary things. So let's, let's run a command against one of the servers that Tom has spun up for us. We've got three, uh, three servers, but we're going to do just one at this time. We're going to be using the ping module and we should see a pong response or we'll see this connection failure. So we'll specify a user, and we'll also specify a password prompt. Take a look at that. There we go. Now let's test all of the servers that we have. These are all servers we arbitrarily spun up just for this demo. Yes. Um, we're not concerned at this point with using SSH keys because we didn't want to go through all of that setup process, but you absolutely should. You should not connect to servers with just username and password. Like we're doing here, this is purely for tutorial purposes to show that it can be done. Yes. Ansible uses SSH as its uh, main connection uh, method. You can manage Windows servers with Ansible but you have to control them through a Linux machine. And for Windows, the connections are done over WinRM. Um, you can send commands to firewalls, printers if you wanted, 
Yeah, anything that has SSH in there, you can script inside of Ansible. So now that we've run our ping against this group of servers, let's do another command. Uh, let's, let's see who's logged in to these servers. So we're going to use the shell module, and we're going to pass an argument to the shell. And that argument is the command w. And we can see that my user, Phil, as specified on the command line, has made a connection to all of these boxes to run w. And now let's run df to see how much disk space we have. The other advantage of using SSH keys, you don't have to type the password each time, so you'll want to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, you're just checking the users and the disk space. Now, can't you have your monitoring do that? Absolutely you could, but sometimes you just want to run these commands um, to, to verify the integrity of a system before you actually start working on it. Uh, a lot of times when I log into a system, I like to see disk space uh, RAM usage and run top um, before I start my actual work there. It can get kind of it can get kind of painful typing in this list of IPs over and over and over. So what we're going to use is now called the inventory. We're not worried about you seeing the root password here. So this inventory file, we can refer to a server or a group of servers by the name within these brackets. So we're going to be managing servers named Steve, Tom, and Phil. Underneath the name of the group is some connection parameters. There are many ways to specify this. Um, we just copy pasted so it looks yeah. like this. And you can also group servers by other group names, so you can have subgroups. Right. This makes it very easy to manage, let's say, all of the servers in um, all of our servers in Michigan and keep them separate from our servers in Ohio or uh, Florida, yes. for instance. You could also, when you're doing this, um, fleet represents all the servers, Steve, Tom, and Phil, and then colon children means Steve, Tom, and Phil are separate servers, so they can specify it individually for sending out the commands. Yes, and we'll show examples of that right now. Since we have this inventory file, we have to tell Ansible about it. So just like we specified our IPs, we can specify the inventory. And now we can use group names. So we're going to run the ping module against Tom, and it is going to make a connection as defined by these connection parameters. So I don't have to type in dash u and then a user and then dash k for a password prompt. It's just going to use what I've already defined. And because we're in the same local directory, it's pulling the file named inventory based on the dash i input. So you could have your Ansible file in another folder. You could have a series of them in folders. Uh, we happen to be in the same folder we're running Ansible and that the inventory file exists that we created. Let's do just that. I'm going to move the inventory into the test folder. Yeah, we don't need to clear the screen. But we'll point at the other file. There we go, same results. Yep. Then I'm gonna move it back. So now we want to target all the servers again by specifying our inventory and we get responses, great. All right, now we're going to run a little bit more of an involved command. I'm of the belief that Vim should be installed on every system and that Emacs should not. Yes.
and we can see from this green output and also that these commands say success and have a return code of zero that we have done the thing that we set out to do. And you can see Tom does not have Emacs installed on this machine. I like Vim <laughs> as well. <laughs> and it's important because these machines are operating essentially headless, you're issuing the command, and that's why he's making sure he issues like QQ so he can not have a bunch of interactive output. That's important that none of these commands be interactive. If not, they'll stop at that screen asking a question. Yes. Uh, back in ye olden days, admins had to use expect and work around uh, those types of problems with with that tool. So now we're going to verify that we do have Vim through dpackage, and we can see that we did install it. Nice. Now, when running ad hoc commands, the output is a bit different than most output that you'll see while searching for Ansible on the internet. My preferred way and most of the internet's preferred way to use Ansible is through roles and playbooks, which we'll get into now. We've installed Vim and verified that we've installed Vim, which is great, but now we want a reproducible script rather than one-liners. And to do that, we're going to create a role. So I've, I've already done this, but I will walk through uh, the role with you, the viewer, I like to put my roles that I'm that I'm working on from my computer into a directory called roles. You can call it whatever you want. This is just something that I prefer to do. And I also prefer to name them ansible-role-whatever the thing is that I'm going to be doing. Since we're creating a tutorial, we'll call this the ansible role tutorial. And inside of here, you'll notice two folders, defaults and tasks. Defaults are a set of default variables that Ansible can use. You can override these as well, and that is an important distinction. Um, and then tasks. Tasks are just like our one-off commands, except they are, they are in a file defined in front of you or any other engineer who's going to be using your code. So now I'm going to open up my Vim and show you defaults and tasks. Now, my Vim is, it has quite a bit of plugins installed, so it's going to look different than your Vim, but the effect is the same. We'll do a separate tutorial on that. <laughs> sure, we can install my Vim code on all three of these servers even. Yeah. What you're seeing in front of you is an Ansible role. Ansible roles are written as YAML files. What you're seeing inside of this file are three tasks. Now a task starts with a dash to the furthest left point of a line. So we have a task named install our packages, another task named remove packages, and then a task to import more tasks. There we go. So this first task, install our packages, uses the package module. And I'm passing the name of a package, but you'll notice that it's actually two curly braces item and two curly braces. This is me using a built-in Ansible variable to take the names of packages from a list of packages, which I will show you momentarily. And we're just going to make sure that these are installed on the system, not that they're the most up to date. I just want them to be there. Now with items is a loop. It will loop through a list of packages as defined by my, my packages variable, which is in my defaults file. And then we're going to clean up packages using the same package module and using the same Ansible built-in variable item, except we're going to make sure that they are absent from the system. And here, we are defining a static list of files. There, there are multiple ways to do things in Ansible. There's no one true right way to do it. Everybody codes differently, just like everybody looks differently. If it works for you, great.
So the my packages variable is actually this list of four different packages, vim, rsync, wget, and telnet. And again, it's referenced right here. So now we're going to run this. And the way that we run this is through a playbook. A playbook is another YAML file, and it has a name, and this might look exactly like a task, and that's because it is. It's tasks all the way down. But in a playbook, we define the hosts, which come from our inventory. In, in a playbook, Ansible will load a file called inventory by default. So we don't have to specify the inventory that we are going to be using. Although we can, I don't feel like opening the documentation at this point to figure out that custom parameter. So it's actually looking for a file named inventory by yes, default? Yes, it is. Okay. And then we're going to specify roles. And since we're using roles local to the disk, I'm going to provide the uh, path to that role. Now, some users may be asking, how come you're not specifying the tasks folder and the main.yaml file? That's because an Ansible playbook will use the main.yaml file inside of the tasks folder by default. It is a built-in uh, Ansible-ism. And now we'll run this. Instead of using just the standard Ansible command, we now use ansible-playbook. Then we can specify playbook. I was wrong. We still have to pass an inventory. But that's as easy as doing this. And I'll go through this output here in a moment. A play is the first task in a playbook. A playbook can be comprised of multiple plays. We won't worry about this for right now. But we can see our tasks coming in from our role. Now you'll see task and then the role from which the task came from and then the name of the task. So we can see install our packages, remove our packages, and then this say hi. Now, that came in from the imported tasks. And that is just a message that says, hi, thanks for watching. Since we have three servers in our fleet that we have defined inside of playbook.yaml, because we are targeting the fleet hosts, we can see several lines stating OK, and several lines stating changed. Lines starting with OK are in green. Lines that are changed are in yellow, and failed tasks will be in red. Everything that changed means that a system was not in a particular state. Now, we can run this code again and see what happens. And you'll notice something different here. Nothing changed. Our system is in the state that we have configured it to be in. Everything has returned OK. This is a, top, this is a term called adempotence. And essentially what you're doing is making sure all the servers are in exactly the same state before you start working on them. Yep. Which is a really important task because before you start issuing commands, you've got to make sure they're all in the same state, all have the same packages, because all this pre-work before you install something saves you all the trouble of why did one server out of this fleet fail? Yes, uh, and we can prevent configuration drift. We can make sure that all of our servers are up to date. Um, if an engineer logs onto a server, they can be assured that the, the correct state is there that they expect to be there in their mental model of that system. Yeah, and they're all the same. So now we're going to cover what tasks were in there and how that part worked. 
So you saw install our packages, remove packages, and then any tasks that came in from this import tasks. And here's how we said hi. But that's not exactly useful, so let's do something else. Let's run ad hoc commands. All right, so now we're going to run an ad hoc command to show the uptime from all of these servers as an actual task defined in a role. And you'll notice here that the shell command has returned changed even though all we're doing is running, running uptime. Now, uptime doesn't change the actual system, but to Ansible, changed means that something happened and it wants the user to know about it. That there's some difference in the servers is what we're it's showing us. Yes. Now, depending on how you want to code your roles, this might be okay i like to i personally like to code my roles so that if if something doesn't return completely okay then i have a server that may have a configuration drift so now this gets into a bit more advanced steps how do we make sure that we can run all of our roles adempotently over and over and over even if they're just regular shell commands. To get all of our tasks to be adempotent, we can use, we can use some special Ansible error handling. Now this particular parameter is called change to win. Now uptime, I know for certain that uptime won't change the state of a system. So we can define that uptime will never, that this shell command running uptime will never return as changed to Ansible. So to the, to the administrator running this playbook, they will only see OK commands instead of these changing commands. As you saw here, everything has returned OK. Now, to extrapolate on this, if you have, if you have firewalls or servers that you have to run one-off commands against um, to check a state or import a database or make sure a configuration contains a certain line, every time you run this playbook, you don't want those same you don't want changes to keep happening so you want to you want to code around this and this is where we'll pick up in another tutorial yeah actually how to fix some of the changes we just want to give you some of the overview stuff so we can kind of start a little bit of a recap here so uh from the command line so go ahead and uh, concatenate some of the files so we started with the inventory file which got us the connection to each of the computers. We defined like the fleet, which the fleet of computers was Steve, Tom, and Phil. So we can run commands against all of them or any of them individually uh, with the Ansible command. Then from there, we did the playbook. And there's the uh, name our first playbook, the host fleet roles, and then we specify what role. Now we can concatenate the role file. Uh, sorry, I've got command line failing right now. <laughs> so, and, and these are the packages. So we had it check against Vim, rsync, wget, and telnet, name, install, or upgrade. And what this did was make sure that those packages are available on each of those servers. Because the, if we, want, we were actually trying to rsync some stuff between them, and we want to make sure we had rsync, we had Vim installed, and it was available on all of this. 
And then the bottom one, we actually we wanted to make sure that none of them had Emacs on there. And it, let's have a little fun with this. Um, let's do the package check again. So okay. run the package check. All right, so we checked the packages and everything's good. Now I'm actually on another computer. I'm going to break it. Tom is currently changing the state of one of these servers. Yep, and I'm not telling Phil which one that was. <laughs> so now he can run the playbook again though. And we're gonna show the differences here. So I actually removed Vim from one of the servers and it noticed. So now we know that that server's out of date. So you can see up there where it says changed 3.77 server uh, item Vim and it's missing. Yes. Now, something that I like to do is set up Ansible to either run on a cron or from um, a continuous integration server, which also runs it on a cron. Yes. But there's a lot more. There's a lot more you can do with continuous integration, so that I can have all of my servers conforming to a specific state. And this gets us more into the chef model of how things are done. Yes, and it's important too because when you have a rogue Tom who goes in and changes something on one server because they they were doing something and thought that, you want as an ad sysadmin to be alerted to that, and that's where this comes in. Is once you have all the structure, and of course, it, it really gets big. I mean, can't I can't imagine how big some of the Ansible files you have are for some of your playbooks based on the number. You run a lot of servers, so that's your day job. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a lot of stuff. So being watching all of that in mass, this is what really that takes that pain away from you, and you can only trace down the problems. Yes, um, I like to have specific roles and specific playbooks that deal with upgrading applications. Um, from from whichever company I'm currently working at, or uh, uninstalling uh, specific applications, I like to separate my maintenance tasks yeah. like that. And and it's uh, it's also really good when there's an outbreak of a problem, being able to go through and upgrade all those machines based on a category and replace whichever pieces need to be replaced on there. So that's pretty cool. I like to. I'm, I'm doing it over on my computer inside. So we plan to probably do some uh, more things. Wow, I broke more stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we'll follow this up on regular camera now. So we're good on this part? Yes. Okay. We're going to do it on regular camera. So this is the first, and it's. I know it's a big overview of Ansible, and we're planning on doing some more tutorials. So people have asked me for some Linux tutorials that are more in-depth. They go beyond some of my skill, but Phil helps me with some of these things. So this was an overview of the Ansible uh, and kind of the basics of some of the files, what Ansible does. I We plan to do more videos. That's the big thing. Uh, Phil says he can commit some time to it, and I'm going to basically contract Phil to make some videos uh, as time allows. So, we, But we need a little bit of feedback to see what are the real things people want to learn about Ansible. He knows a lot about it, so that's sometimes the hard part. When you have a lot of knowledge and you've been using something day to day, it becomes, how do I... <laughs> <laughs> you know, do this or do this versus uh, we just do, you know, because you just are using it all the time. How long have you been doing Ansible, Phil? I've been using this tool for about three years. Yeah, so three years of use means it's sometimes hard to pinpoint where exactly to get started. This tutorial is like a real brief overview to some of your inventory file, your playbook, your roles, what Ansible is used for, making sure servers are in sync, which is uh, what Phil has to do a lot. I mean, uh, what's Probably the biggest setup you've done with Ansible in number of servers quantity-wise. Um, the the largest deployment I have was about 70 servers in one particular region of the world, and it would deploy all the aspects of an application um, from building the base server to actually deploying the application, configuring the firewalls, doing all the backups, and uh, setting up monitoring and all of that. That's so rather than log into 70 servers, which is just an unreasonable task <laughs> that no one should ever be burdened with, uh, this is what you would use this for to be able to be able to uh, go through and say, all right, are all 70 servers up to date? Do all 70 servers have this package installed? Do all 70 servers need uh, this upgrade? So when things like Heartbleed come out, you have 70 servers that need SSL updates if they're web-facing and are running web tools, which I'm assuming they probably are. A lot yes. of this does. Um, I've also used this 
uh, when a server fails in the middle of the night. Instead of getting alerted, depending on what type of server it is, you just want it to rebuild itself. And through automation and configuration management, you can make that a reality. So when you come in the next day, you can say, oh, five servers failed? Okay. And they're back? All right. No yeah. human needs to be woken up for that. Yeah, and it, that's a really cool feature as it gets more advanced. And we're trying to figure out at what level we should get these details in. It would be pretty extensive to get to that level, sure, but it's something that can be done. So if one server just goes down, it, and sometimes it is. It's easy just to reboot it. It's to reload it even, and you can get that extensive with the scripting in here. Uh, and that goes way beyond me and way more what Bill does. Than, <laughs> well, I'm just going to be doing some basic Ansible stuff because I've been wanting to just, we have a handful of virtual machines here. It's only five. I don't have 70 servers here, uh, but I want to be able to easily uh, check the uptime on all of them, shut down all of them, update all of them at the same time. So I've been learning Ansible slowly, but I, not quite enough to do a tutorial, but we'll, we're kind of figuring out the happy middle here and uh, what you guys want to hear. So uh, leave comments below of uh, some of the specific things you're looking for and it'll hopefully drive a future series of videos we uh, get on this. Uh, as I, I realized when I started looking, there's not a lot of good tutorials on it, uh, at least not that I found. Uh, but I've always asked Phil, and I've, always, I've been in the Linux and open source community my forever, so I always know people in this. So I want to start bringing those people to YouTube to uh, learn this. It's also a learning experience for Phil because uh, we recorded things and had to stop a few times because there's always like, oh, this one command or that command. <laughs> the, uh, this, this process of training is a... Uh, there's a lot that just gets deleted, he's learned. It's not like I start one, start to finish all the time. It's like, oh yeah, there's a lot of pauses, cuts, and I had to look up a command to remember how to teach how to do it. So, But uh, as always, thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, and all that fun stuff. And let us know what you think. Comments below or join the forums and drop some messages there. We will also leave a link to any of the files we talked about here. And so you can actually see all the files raw uh, on Phil's GitHub. There'll be a tutorial. I'm going to leave a link in the description below to all that. Um, and also, uh, we mentioned a couple times like uh, SSH and dot file setups uh, and desktop in the environment setups. Phil has all of the things he uses, which are pretty extensive, and I use them on mine as well, on his GitHub as well. And uh, that might be a fun tutorial, just how to set up your, your environment on a new computer. Sure. So I think it'll be a fun tutorial. All right, thanks again.